Welcome to Start By Listening, the podcast about sexual harm and trauma. We are centered on educating and empowering our Western Kentucky communities. Our goal is to transform the way we talk about sexual harm and trauma. Transformation begins by listening to understand. We talk so you can listen today and change the world tomorrow. So hello everyone and welcome back to Start By Listening. It's Jennifer, aka The Friendly Therapist. I'm here with my PIC and my co-host, Shelby. Hello, welcome back everybody. We are so glad that you are tuning in today. And as you can tell, um, this area is a little different than what you are used to seeing. And so we're in one of our co-workers' offices and as always, We are very authentic. You could hear the copier machine. You could hear a phone ring. You could hear somebody knocking on a door. It is what it is. It is 2022. Today, we are here with some amazing people from Brescia University right here in Owensboro, Kentucky. And we're going to be talking about traumas on the university level, things that perhaps... um, these students who are coming into the university are experiencing, are bringing with them, or who knows how this beautiful conversation is going to evolve. But I'm so excited to be here today. And so I'm going to ask our amazing guests to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about who they are and what they do at Brescia. Welcome. Who would like to go first? We'll just go in order. I'll go first. <laughs> All right. Good morning. I'm Patricia Lovett. I am currently the interim vice president for uh, for Dean Students uh, Student Affairs at Russia University. I'm coming out of my tenth year at Russia. Oh wow. Um, my twenty second year working in higher ed. Um, so you name it, I've been worked at different places. I started out in admissions and then went to student life, went to residence life. So and I've pretty much landed. I think in student life. Um, some of the things that we do on a daily basis is um, just help students wherever they need support. We'll try to be a resource for them. They kind of you know, label us maybe the fun, fun, fun department, but I think all departments are great. Um, but we do more of the student activities for them, um, the career piece that they're missing. Um, we have counseling in our area. We have campus ministry, so reach out to students who um, with different religious beliefs and trying to bring them together. Um, and then we also cover residence life. So our students who live in taking care of them, making sure their needs are met. So um, that's kind of what we do in our area in a nutshell. So that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm thinking of an umbrella and like, whoo, there's a lot of smokes. Yes. Oh, wow. You bring a wealth of knowledge today. Oh, I can't wait to hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Morgan Russellberg. Um, I'm the Director of Career Services at Brush University. Um, I work underneath Patricia in the Student Affairs Office. Um, and previously, I also had the title of Disability Services Coordinator. Mm. So I bring that um, to the table as well today. And I help all our students with professional readiness. So resumes, cover letters, all the things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I help a lot with our student leader training. So um, we do that as well. Oh, wonderful. Hello, everyone. Uh, follow Larry Hostetter. I'm the president of Brescia University, and I've been there for 23 years, not as president for 23 years. But so, Trisha, you and I have been in higher ed about the same amount of time, although I obviously started <laughs> much, much later than she did. <laughs> so, we're really thrilled to be here. Oh, we're so glad you all said yes. Um, you know, for this season, we're calling it hodgepodge, mm-hmm. and we were just thinking about, actually, I think, Shelby, you're the one getting the idea of, like, each month being, like, what, I'm going to get it wrong. Like, like a mini-series yeah. focusing on different areas of the community and how trauma affects those areas. So we just wrapped up with the religious portion, but however, Russia is a... Catholic campus. So this is kind of going to be a great bridge episode between the two mini series talking from both education, which we're going into and the religious piece. So I think it's going to be great. Yeah. So with that in mind, what just globally, when you hear the word trauma and you think of Russian university, students, staff, faculty, admin, what kind of is bubbling up to the surface that seems poignant and very much at the surface and that you all would like our community to know? And you have three different areas, so three different perspectives, right? Well, I think, you know, Morgan mentioned in the pre-talk 
that, that you know many of our students bring trauma with them yeah. then and, and often that doesn't really manifest itself sometimes until people leave home mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, so that's a, a big concern uh, but you, your question threw me because I wasn't expecting it so good job oh. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> but it was what's bubbling to the surface globally mm -hmm. and um, you, as I think about that question, what occurs to me is all of the things that people deal with in their personal lives mm. that's maybe separate and distinct from their life at, or their work at Brescia, but that's a constant refrain in the background mm. of their lives. Faculty, staff, students, everybody. And it just seems like maybe it's because of you know, pandemic is winding down and we're still recovering from that. Just seems like that has intensified over the last months or year of people just really struggling with stuff back home. Or, and, and it doesn't necessarily get in the way with their work because our employees are all incredibly professional, but it, it, it's there. It does. And it, it needs to be addressed in some fashion. Yeah. That's, that's what I would say is bubbling to the surface for me. <sighs> to piggyback on what Larry said, I think that the pandemic caused a lot of these traumas or things that we deal with to really just come to the surface. Mm -hmm. um, and so now they're there and now we're trying to figure out what ways to navigate them. And I think finally we're in a space where we're able to have those conversations. Before it was just, um, just kind of keep it to yourself. Yeah. And I say that only from my community as in part of the black community um, it's very much looked down upon to get counseling, to seek help. And um, so now it's, it's it's becoming more of a, a custom. It's more acceptable. It's still not as much. But in, in where I grew up, it's like you suck it up, move on. That's how we've always been, or pray it away. Yes. And so now we're having those conversations. And it's, it's, it's refreshing to know that you can have it and it's not a stigma of, you got to deal with it on your own, and you. And when you start to have those conversations, you realize that um, a lot of people are going through the same things so you're going through. You never even know it, and, and so um, that's good. But having the courage just to have the conversation has always been, I would say, a problem in the community that I've grown up in all my life. So it's a beautiful sentiment. Um, and it, it, you know, if you think about that, those two things, the things that above that are coming to the surface because of the pandemic that have always been there, but maybe have been silent to this point, you all as student affairs people and our faculty too, are dealing with students that are experiencing that while also the normal university college level traumas, you know, losing a scholarship, having a relationship that breaks up, yes. uh, even, you know, sexual assault or sexual violence or trying to struggle with that, uh, any number of things, getting, you know, kicked off of a team or you're, you're not, you're not performing as an athlete. Like you want, I mean, it's just any number of things that have always been there. And so now you're combining that with what COVID gave us, which is things coming to the surface that, in the past might have been quiet. I know you all are having to struggle with those kinds of things. Yeah, um, I think kind of everything that Patricia and Father Larry have said is right on point for me. Like I said, I work a lot with training our student leaders as well. Um, and we work on really building community within those leaders mm -hmm. so that they can also help other students. So for us, helping those freshmen move through the college experience in a seamless way. And when we're working with those student leaders, I mean, the things that we learn um, that they're dealing with, like Father Larry said, that has nothing to do with Brescia maybe, or nothing that happened to them while they were on campus, but things that they're dealing with personally. And it's like, okay, add on all of the college stuff, you know, on top of things. And you're like, I mean, there sometimes I'm like, you're all of that, you know, like, how can we help you? And I think, as faculty and staff, we also are like a little bit overwhelmed sometimes because we're like, how do we navigate all of those things and help our students move forward? And I think we do well training 
our staff and faculty on how to do that. But um, I think for our students and then from a staff perspective, things we have going on at home, things the pandemic um, gave to us and, you know, having that, the ability to help students and relate to them in a way, but also like dealing with our own yeah. struggles. It's, it's, it's a lot to unpack sometimes. Um, but I think for us, you know, that's kind of what's coming to the top. It's just everybody is overwhelmed. And so I guess right before school starts, we do a training with our student leaders um, to get them ready. And so we do a lot of boundary breaking and breaking down those barriers where you get to learn about everybody. And so mm-hmm. one thing they always say is they didn't realize how much everybody is going through the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, how much um, their struggles don't do. It's, it's different from those, but everybody's got those struggles. Yeah. And at the end of the night, we do something with them. I won't go into detail because I don't want to <clears throat> foreclose whatever we do, but um, we do something where we it, we lift them up. And at the end of the night, we're, they're all in a circle and they're all crying because mm-hmm. they feel comfortable that we broke down those barriers and had those conversations and they they let us in on everything that's going on. But then you you have those barriers and then you build yourself up back from that. So, you know, we continue to still have those conversations with them throughout the semester. They're constantly, more so with Morgan because I've been super busy, but they're always checking in with her and the other, um, the other uh, our res life person, just, hey, this happened or whatever. And they feel comfortable with having those conversations now because they already broke down that barrier. And we know what we know what your struggle is. We know what your trauma is. So we, they don't have to come in and give us an explanation. And they're like, oh, this happened, or my mom and dad did this, but I'm trying to do this. And we just, we just listen. A lot of times it's just to vent, but they need that, that space and have those conversations. So, um, so I, I'm, I'm glad that we've had that. I would love to see the opportunity to do that with more of our students, and we're hoping to do that in the future. But the fact that they feel comfortable enough to talk to us, um, and then some of them have even said, you know, I am not an expert. I can listen, but we will get you to the counseling that you need here in the community. You can start with our counselor here at Russia. But please, if, if you're still feeling this way, we want to encourage you to get the help you need. And you can do it, and honestly, nobody will ever have to know. But I need to know that you're going to be okay because um, you're not only a student leader, but, you know, if you can help yourself, then how are you going to help others? And that's the biggest mm-hmm. thing we tell them is you have to identify and know your struggles. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, at least you know that, then you, you have, they have so much empathy for the students when they come to campus, particularly in this concept of when we're trying to um, help our new freshmen and all the struggles they come in with. Oh, yeah. And so we do a lot of extensive training the first couple of days before school, before they come to orientation to get them ready for that. And so when things happen, they're not surprised. They're, they feel, feel somewhat empowered and they have the tools to be able, what well, they need to help our students. But yeah, just it's every year I think, oh, this group's got it together. They're fine. And then at the end of the night, they all break down and they just unload on us what's going on with them, which is fine. You know, and that makes us, we're, and that makes them vulnerable in the same instance. We do the same thing. We have to break down those barriers too and let them know that, you know, we understand what you're going through. You know, we've been there, but here's our struggle as, um, as adults, as parents, as, you know, things like that. So at the end of the, at the end of the day, we, we know that and we help each other. So it's, it's been good, but it was just, I think every year, oh, they're not going to tell us anything. And then they don't love us. So. Yeah. And I, I think it's important to you to piggyback on that. You know, we have quite a large international student population. And so that comes with also its own set of oh, yeah. trauma and struggle. And we have students who don't go home sometimes until they graduate, um, you know, and things like that. And they're here over breaks and so that also is another like, subset mm-hmm. of things we're experiencing. And I think sometimes, you know, we talk about really helping students and them telling us <coughs> their struggles and us giving that back to them. And sometimes, you know, I do this in our training. I'm like, if y'all need a mom hug, I'm a mom. Like, would you just come in the office. Just tell me you need a hug. And that's what we'll do. I have had in the last two years, <laughs> probably eight to 10 students who frequently just come in my office and they're like, I don't want to talk about it. I just need a hug. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's all it takes, you know? And so I think we tell our student leaders that too. Like sometimes people don't want to tell you things and they don't have to tell you things, but there are other ways you can be there for them. Yes. And I think that's a good way that we show them that is just by offering like, you don't have to tell me what's up. I'll just give you a hug, whatever you need. Um, So I think that's a big part of our training as well. Because, you know, they are away from home and they don't um, have, they have parents or, 
you know, some of them don't, some of them. The biggest thing I've seen, too, is <clears throat> we have several students who have come from the foster care system. Mm -hmm. And so the trauma that they may have experienced um, from the system, um, the, the fact that maybe they are no longer or don't have that family support once they turn 18, and trying to navigate um, how to be an adult. Um, that's one of the things that I didn't realize after talking with <clears throat> one of our social worker faculty. She was like, you know that sometimes when they turn 18, they just, like, you're 18, you have to leave our house now. You know, and, you know, making sure they have their birth certificate, make sure they have social security cards. Some of them still really haven't had a job. You know, so those, that's just trauma within itself. And then if you don't have that family support because maybe your family has passed along or maybe, mm -hmm. unfortunately, your parents or your family is possibly um, in prison. So, you know, and then whatever you've gone through and then the reasons why you got put into the system. That's another population of students that I see that bring, like we also bring it to campus or bring it to us. And then um, so sometimes we don't even know until they, until they disclose to us that's happened. So, and then we try to give them or help them out and give them the tools they need to be able to, to navigate that. So. And they deserve an education as yes. much as anybody, and yes. it, but they have additional challenges that others might not have, or at least more visible challenges. You know, Patricia used a word that I thought was, was incredibly important, tools, giving them the tools they need. Mm -hmm. So the more we talk about the mom hug, we give them the support yeah. yes. that they need, you know, while they're with us, but they're not only with us forever. It's going to be a time when they graduate and move on. So in addition to that important support, we want to somehow figure out a way to give them the tools they need so that they can function um, and deal with, you know, the, whatever they're dealing with in a lifelong way and have at least, the, you know, basic tools of how to be resilient, how to deal with difficulties, how to seek out help. Um, and then even some things like you talked about, you know, the, the ability just to, to find ways of coping with, with difficult situations because, you know, they graduate if they're traditional age students they are 22 years old, you know, they've had another 80, 70 years of <laughs> difficult times and wonderful <laughs> times. And, uh, you know, if all of that, hopefully we can help in some small way of, of you know, helping them to deal with that. The other piece that I think is really important, I think you're going to be involved with this in our faculty, is helping our faculty to understand what trauma-informed pedagogy is, you know, how to yeah. understand that the people in your classroom are uh, coming from different experiences and that may require different ways of presenting material, uh, being sensitive to material that, is, you know, is... Uh, might trigger uh, a certain response um, any number of ways. And I know you're coming to talk to our faculty about that. So. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, polyvagal theory, which is all about the nervous system um, and trauma stewardship and understanding what traumas are, right? And I, one of my uh, colleagues in the community, he put this so eloquently. Trauma is like the buzzword now, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's this entire group of individuals, I think, in our society, I'm going to go like macro, um, that think, oh, trauma is only something like war, right? Like that. And yes, that is a very distinct trauma. Absolutely. But trauma are bad things that happen to us. And it doesn't matter how big or how small, because that makes no difference to our nervous system. It is just our body and our nervous system's way of interpreting that. And not only can traumas be bad things that happen to us, but it can also be the lack of good things that we didn't get to experience as well. You know, talking about like foster care youth, you know, um, having to move from home to home, not having the ability to establish roots or family traditions, right? That's a trauma. We don't even think about that sometimes. Um, grief and loss, um, that's a trauma. And it can be loss of a relationship. It doesn't have to be death, right? Uh, loss of a pet. There's so many things. And I think um, as we're on this journey, I can speak like 
almost three years ago when COVID happened, I learned very quickly that my coping skills that used to work for me no longer were working, right? And I remember doing therapy over a computer screen. I was like, this is crazy. There's like, there's no connection. Like, yeah, I need connection. Um, I realized very quickly that my clients could not process their sexual trauma because we were living in a trauma and we still are, we still are. And the way polyvagal <coughs> theory is, and it's beautiful. We are only capable of learning no matter how young, how old, we are only capable of learning when we are in a space of ventral. And ventral is that top piece of our nervous system where we feel safe and connected. Um, and so students, um, I'm working with Autumn Elementary with Sarah Duke, the guidance counselor as well, Polly Vagel, understanding that when people come to work, when people come to school, People come to college, they're bringing all that stuff with them. 20 years ago, we used to tell people, uh, you need to leave that at the door. I remember being told that in my grind program, you need to leave that at the door. Um, well, guess what? That's not very authentic. <laughs> As a way of sneaking in. It, it will. It'll leach in. It'll just, right? Um, <clears throat> and the more I can learn how to regulate my nervous system by doing very simple things, to be more resilient, to be able to move up and down throughout my day instead of crashing and burning. That's what it is. Um, and teaching my clients those skills, tools, has made a world of difference. Teaching coworkers those skills has made a world of difference. The ability to go through the next 80 years, like you said, Father Larry, life's got to have lots of ups and downs. It's going to. And we have to learn those skills so we can ride those waves because they're going to come whether we want them or not. Well, and I like what you said about, you know, you can't, we talk a lot about this in student affairs, Maslow's hierarchy and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And like, I feel like you said, they can't learn unless they feel safe. Yeah. So, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, if we have a student come to us who is coming from a food insecure home, maybe, well, now they're in a place where we have three meals a day. But like, what does that look like for them? And if they're not getting fed and they don't feel safe, like they can't go to calculus and be successful, even if they know calculus. Mm -hmm. And so I think when I worked with disability services too, a lot of that bubbled to the top of like, okay, you need these accommodations, but the things that brought that to the front, you are still struggling with. And yeah, you're struggling in the classroom, but this is why. And so I think the fact that you're coming to talk about that to faculty is amazing because I think sometimes also our students really get down on themselves when they're not doing well in the classroom or they, their professors are like, okay, you're not, you know, I mean, just this week I teach a first year experience course and I had to say to my students, I have more students failing right now than I ever in my life as, you know, doing this in the last four years, like what is happening? You know, I gave them all a paper and said, come see me, you know, if it had an F on it, I was like, come see me because if you are struggling with those things, I can't expect you to perform at the level that that course expects. So let's talk about that. So I really like that you brought that up. I think that's something we're going to see in higher ed for a while mm -hmm. is that uh, yeah, these students that we have were in high school during lockdown mm -hmm. and they were taking classes virtually. Uh, sometimes they were going to class, sometimes they weren't. They started going back to class, then it would stop again. Uh, you know, parents would get sick, grandparents would get sick, and all the family members were dying. Yes. Um, that, there's a whole lot to unpack there that I don't know if any one person can do, and it's probably going to be something that they take with them the rest of their lives. But in the meantime, we're going to find, and it's not going to be unique to pressure, we're going to find them struggling yes. in the classroom. Um, which is why I think this trauma-informed pedagogy is, is so important. I do have a question, and I don't know if it's appropriate to ask during the, the, <laughs> sure. the middle of the podcast. As you mentioned, uh, and Anna and I were talking this morning, and you mentioned it again, um, trauma stewardship. Now, yeah. stewardship is a, as a theologian, is a theologically loaded term. Mm 
<laughs> um, and it, it means something pretty, it's pretty serious. So when you say stewardship, are you saying we steward our own trauma or are we responsible for stewarding other people's trauma? Which means, Both. Okay. Both. It's a beautiful concept. Um, and it is a very large thing to unpack. It's... I learned, and I use the analogy of a boat and a captain. I learned how to captain my own ship of my life that has trauma in it, inherently because I'm a human being. And I also learn how um, the organization that I work for, like here, we work for New Beginnings, you all work for Russia. I also learned how New Beginnings has an ethical responsibility and a moral responsibility to help trauma, excuse me, to help steward the trauma that I experienced as an employee working uh-huh. in this environment, right? Because I'm getting paid money to work eight to 10 hours a day, four to five days a week in trauma. So while in this space right here, right now, this is relatively calm, right? It's, it's, it's nice. It's pretty chill. However, what's happening in, in the background are crisis sessions, therapy sessions, legal mm-hmm. advocacy sessions. All that is trauma. Energy is energy. Nervous systems are energetic. Um, I'm absorbing that in my body for 8 to 10 hours a day. I'm also absorbing my own clients in the moment their trauma, right? It's called secondary trauma. It's not mine, but I'm experiencing it. My body is experiencing it. So there's an ethical and moral responsibility for new beginnings to help me steward the trauma they're paying me to work in. Boy, that's a whole new concept, isn't it? What does that mean? Oh, gosh. It means different things for different organizations. So then here's the micro. Right, then we're gonna go to the mezzo level. I'm talking about the social workers. <laughs> um, let's look at the community. Why? Let's talk about the traumas that are experienced in our community in different groups and in different areas. Um, I have a moral and an ethical responsibility as a member of this community to help that as well. What does that look like? Well, it means different things. And then let's look macro globally um if you want to look at things like um our water our land um animals all of that i have an ethical and a moral responsibility to help steward that trauma that as human beings we place upon the world and it, it's going to be a beautiful uh, training. That's one of my favorites. And it came from the book called Trauma Stewardship. Um, I'm going to get her name. I'm going to butcher it because I wasn't prepared. Her name is Lipnitsky Newt. I'll, I'll get you the book, by the way. But that is what stewardship means in this. And it's we have to help each other and teach each other how we become those captains because nobody grows up now i mean i'm a child of the 70s went to school in the 80s went to catholic schools my whole life i mean my parents are the silent generation they were born in the depression so they're much older feelings what are those you know there's so much that i have and i have so much hope for the, the futures, but we have to learn skills and tools. We have to learn how to regulate our nervous system through activities where we can weather the storms. Um, and we have to learn trauma can be anything bad that happens to you, and like you don't get to tell me what's trauma, mm-hmm. like I don't get to tell you. And I think Brene Brown said it best in her most recent book and her series on HBO Max, Atlas of the Heart. Um, Empathy, right? That is the antidote to shame. It is. Shame is in the dark. We give it the antidote of empathy. We bring it into the light. And I don't have to 
walk in your shoes, right? She says that you can't walk in somebody's shoes. You can only walk in your own. Um, but as a human being, all I have to do is believe and listen. That's it. Just believe. Whatever experience you're telling me, Patricia, even if it's nothing I will ever experience, like, um, I think you said you're a mom, right? I will never experience that. I have no idea what that's like. I listen to you and I believe you. If you tell me potty training is the worst thing ever, I can be like, well, I don't know. No, I can be like, you know what? Yes. And I do believe you. It is. <laughs> Butter yeah. five and two. So. I think it's such an important concept, maybe for the higher ed uh, landscape. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we need from my perspective, I probably need to ask some more questions in terms of nuance and such. Uh, what I would want to avoid is that our uh, student affairs professionals or our faculty who are stewarding trauma don't become responsible for other people's trauma or how Absolutely. they um, or how that person responds to their personal trauma. Uh, because that's easy to do if you're a caring person. It's easy oh, to get yes. sucked into somebody else's yes. trauma. Mm-hmm. And that's why I was saying stewardship is so loaded. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, biblically, the steward is responsible. Mm-hmm. And if the steward doesn't get it right, they're the one that's in trouble. Mm, interesting. So, I would, you know, I was thinking about that. I thought, well, I would hope nobody ever thinks, you know, yeah. I've got somebody who's experienced trauma that I care about as opposed to care for. Yes. Um, and uh, that person has made some made a bad decision. Mm-hmm. I want my professionals, my faculty, to understand that's not your responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I don't know if stewardship mm-hmm. draws it a little bit more. In, maybe theologically, maybe I've got a different concept of stewardship. Yeah. So I'm interested in hearing this uh, yeah. this yeah. discussion. It is. You're you're very correctly. You know, um, like. Social Work 101, Therapy 101, um, the concerns or the problems that your client brings to you are not yours. They are not, right? Um, And it is my responsibility to give them tools and to help them see how to use those tools and to ask questions perhaps they don't even want it to answer, you know, and it's like uh, boundaries. Um, it's like hugs. Like you said, you know, if you need a hug, well, what if in that moment, Morgan, someone is needing a hug and you don't have the capacity in this moment to give that to them. Mm-hmm. Right. So then the question philosophy, are you going to sacrifice yourself for the better of somebody else? Ooh, spicy. I don't know. Right. It is, understanding how can I set a boundary where I'm hearing, I'm responding, but I'm also, right, protecting what I need. You know, like what if you had just ran over two dogs on your way to work and a squirrel and then you spilled coffee? Can Or do you have the capacity to hold space in that moment? Probably not. I think our students need that too. I mean, you know, followers and faculty and staff, which I totally agree because I struggle with that on the daily, but you know, of like, I'm whatever you need in this moment, I'm going to do my best to give that to you regardless of what I have going on. Mm-hmm. And I should probably be better about that, but that's part of the reason why I'm in this field. <laughs> um, but also our students, our student leaders, um, our athletes, the captains on our teams are also being told about all of this trauma that their friends are encountering. <sighs> yeah. What do they do with that? Oh, and Getting them to understand, especially when we have students who are experiencing depression mm-hmm. and have experienced suicidal thoughts, mm-hmm. that is not yours to carry. Mm-hmm. And how do you tell, like, I struggled with this, you know, several weeks ago, explaining to a student how you, you can't carry that for them. Like, you can't. But how do you care for them and, and be their friend and help hold their hand? I think the phrasing used was, you can't carry them through this, you can hold their hand. Mm-hmm. And how do you do that? But also, like you said, protecting your own emotional mm-hmm. space and your own self and knowing that you can't fix it. Because I also relate to students in that way. I'm a fixer. And immediately when somebody tells me something is wrong, I'm like, what are we going to do? And sometimes you can't. And it's not your security. And so I think that's something important for our students as much as it is for us to know. Yeah. 
I think, I hate the word trickle down in every other sense, but I think trauma stewardship, to me at least, it's learning how to manage your own trauma so you can help someone else learn to manage theirs. You can hold space with healthy boundaries and teach them the skills that you know so that they can also learn those skills to be able to process and walk through their trauma and then also have the boundaries so that not only are they keeping themselves safe, but they're not oversharing and harming you in the matter because there's different layers to how much I can ask someone to hold for me. I can ask you to hold space all day. However, when I start imposing myself, then that's me trying to take from you. Um, does that make sense? Is that kind of... It's interesting covered? to say that because that's, that's a skill that's very hard to try to learn at, mm -hmm. at, at this mm -hmm. age and I mean I think some of us still struggle with that and oh, yes. um, now here I use my daughter's example use my students example it's the same story but they come in and they're like my, <clears throat> I'll use my daughter example she's in high school whatever so she messaged me and she's mom my friend's going through it I'm gonna be there for her and it's happened a couple times so the conversation I have with her is okay what's the next steps because I mean she's young and she doesn't know it. it's the same thing I mean she's 16 our students are 18 19 it's the same thing mm -hmm. and I said what can we do to help her get to where she needs to be? Because you don't need to carry this burden. Yeah. Um, you can walk and said, walk along beside her, but carry this burden. I said, you know, I said, I think the next step is to talk to the school counselor, <clears throat> let her know what's going on and see if the school counselor has other resources for her. And I said, you would be a great fan to walk alongside her and take her there and have those conversations. I said, because you're young and you're learning and you're developing, but you can't carry your friend's burden. And I'm glad that the friend <clears throat> trusts you and wants to vent to you about different things. But what can we do? And I, said, and I said, I need you to think about this. Mm -hmm. And so that, so that's the same thing that when our students come in, at, at some point they, they reach their tipping point. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't know what to do. They keep telling me this and I feel guilty. And we're like, you know, you you walk alongside them. You cannot carry this burden. And so just encouraging them to walk them to our counselor. Mm -hmm. If they don't want to go to counselor, encouraging them for the resources that we have. I think we're, we left out today. We're having a health fair. They have like the beginnings of there and some other people in the community. And it's, it's the resources that they need to be able to to help themselves to be able to, to cope. Um, and I think we all feel like, you know, we, we can't tell anybody. We have to we have to be there for our friend and we have to keep it all in. And that's just, it's not healthy. And so encouraging them that, to ask for help. That's, yeah. that's still a, a big thing with our students. But, and I think it's, sometimes it's, people like i mean we have a conversation this morning and I'm like, why do you need help because <laughs> like, we don't want to go ask for help and so i was like can you do me a favor I'm like it's not a favor we're working together we're colleagues <laughs> yeah. it's like yeah that's true but it's just asking so well, and so that could be it. Are. the trauma response and in, in, in trauma stewardship there are 16 basic responses that we can have to traumas we have encountered and one of them is um, really struggling with asking for our needs, mm -hmm. right? And asking for help because maybe growing up it wasn't safe to yeah. say, I need this or I need help with, mm -hmm. um, you know? So I think that's a beautiful example that you gave, you know, about your daughter. And um, I think too, if we want to raise uplift, empower young people to be able to make good choices in life, right? It is um, helping them, meeting them where they are, helping them problem solve because, you know, this area, our prefrontal cortex, it is not fully developed until 25. 25. I mean, that's way after some people leave college. And then college. starts falling apart after 30 I know, <laughs> right? It gets like Swiss cheese or something, right? But these are our behaviors. These are our impulses, our emotions. Um, not to, not even to mention hormones that are maybe not even cyclical and they're spiking. But all of that to say, they don't know how to sit and do... Um, an analysis of pros, cons, um, yes, no, maybes, right? And it's also, I think, and I see this a lot with parents that I work with, they don't want to let their children fail at something, mm -hmm. right? I don't want them to be hurt. They've already been hurt enough, right? They've already been abused and, oh, 
I just, I don't want them to, I'm like, you're setting them up to have more harm in the future. I don't know about you all, but I can say I'm 40, soon to be 47. So I'm going to tell you to speak my age out there. Um, I have learned more in my life from the failures that I have had and the mistakes that I have made than I've ever learned from my successes. And I was very honored and privileged to have a beautiful support system in my life that helped me manage those emotions when they happen, right? Not everybody has that. That's the key. It's not, as Dr. Uh, Delore McKay talks about, it's not the physical trauma that really impacts us, but it's when we are left alone with those thoughts and emotions after. That's where the real trauma comes from. That's when we get those negative thoughts about ourselves. I'm not good enough. It's my fault. I'll never be good. Those kinds of things. But yeah. You know, with our students that are trying to support their friends, I think mm-hmm. some of the hardest lessons to learn is that yeah. um, some you can't fix everything, mm-hmm. and sometimes you just have to let people hurt oh. because that's where they're at and yeah. that's what they're going through, and you can't fix other people's hurt. Mm-hmm. And you know, for whatever reason, they're hurting right now, and if you're their friend, you just want them to stop hurting. Yeah, but. That's not something that can just be switched off, you know, or made better with ice cream. You know, probably something helps a little bit with ice cream, but you know, uh, yes. be made better. Yeah. But, yeah. And I think that's just a hard life lesson. And it doesn't, I don't think our traditional age students, I don't, that's not anything they can learn yet. In fact, like you said, I don't think they're in a place to really learn that yet. It's hard. We see a lot of hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's hard being on this side and seeing that right every day mm-hmm. and I also know and I know and I know I had heart and gut know that hurt leads to healing you know just like in your body if you um, have to get stitches as they heal it does hurt um, and to be able to sit and hold space with somebody in that hurt and not take it on, you know, 24 year old social worker, Jennifer was very different than 47 year old social worker, Jennifer. Um, and I, at one point had that thought of, oh my gosh, I have to take this on. Like mm-hmm. right? That's my job. Um, gotta fix it. I gotta fix it. If I can bring something religious in. Absolutely. Uh, the um, and I know for a lot of people, and uh, probably many of your listeners, you know, religion is a source of a lot of their trauma, and it can that, be. that is undeniable. Um, and but um, it can also be a source of healing for for many. Uh, there's a theologian named Romano Guardini, and somebody asked him the question, "How can God allow people to hurt?" or to be in pain, or to allow this evil to happen, or somebody suffering. And uh, he, he said, there's no answer. God doesn't give an answer to the question except for that. And he pointed his finger at the crucifix. And he said, God never gave an answer, but from the Christian tradition, God became one of us so that he could experience what we experience, so that when we hurt, we know that God sits with us and understands our pain. Mm. So it's not, again, Mm -hmm. trying to give an answer. Why is this person suffering at this point? Because there is usually no answer to that. Instead, the answer is you can sit with someone in pain. There's no answer to why people suffer. But as Guardini would say, if God can sit with us in our pain, in pain, understanding pain himself, um, then that's what what we can do. Oh, that's beautiful. I've never heard of, because I don't read a lot of religious stuff, so I would think you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I think it's pain is going to happen. It's a part of being human, but feeling that pain is processing. 
and sitting with it, but we're hardwired to be fixers. We're hardwired to want to make people feel better, but that's just putting a mask on it rather than letting it heal naturally. I'm just trying to tap down and then it's going to come out in other ways, right? You know, I'm so glad you said that because, um, uh, and I know this is not the intent of this, and I know your theme is of trauma in various circumstances in life, but I, I wouldn't want to give the impression that the college experience, which I don't think we are, but just in case, what do I give the experience that the college experience is nothing more than stealing from trauma to trauma to trauma to trauma. And all our mm -hmm. student affairs folks do is help people in trauma. <laughs> because there's so much, it's obviously so much more. Oh, yeah. But when I when I look at our students and I see them arrive as freshmen and then I see them graduate for maybe five, sometimes six years later, um, at whatever time it needs, they're changed. Mm -hmm. um, they've developed skills, they've become more confident. I've seen students who couldn't look at you in the eye when they came. They were that shy, who were giving presentations by the time they were seniors and ready to work, move into the workforce. So I, you know, I think it's important that we deal with the trauma that uh, our students, faculty, staff, whoever walks on our campus is dealing with, because that if you don't deal with it, we can't get to that point of, yes. of achievement, yes. but I don't also want it to overcloud the fact that just incredible things happen, not just in Brescia, but all colleges and universities at the age between 18 and 22, and they used to teach high school. I think more happens between 18 and 22 than 14 and 18. I mean, there, it's just, uh, it's, it's amazing how somebody goes to really being a child to adulthood, mm -hmm. and and we are so privileged mm -hmm. to be uh, a part of that. But we also want to make sure it happens, which is why it's the well, problem. Yeah. 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 Well, I think something that is phenomenal about Russia, and I have heard this for years. Like, I, you know, I was born and raised here, and I left and went to Louisville and came back in 2010, but. <laughs> The international students, like, I have always heard that Brescia just has a huge international student population, you know, compared to, like, you know, other, you know, mm -hmm. colleges and universities. I cannot think of a more beautiful experience for a local Owensboroan or Kentuckian who comes to Owensboro to go to Brescia than to meet, I don't want to say kids, teenagers, young adults their age from a different part of the world mm -hmm. like that hands down I think is the coolest thing I went to Bellarmine University that's where I got my undergrad and I remember there were maybe five to seven international students that was it mm -hmm. out of oh gosh back then 2,500 3,000 students right not a lot and it was a larger campus but to be able to sit down and have coffee and talk about what are things you've experienced in your country mm -hmm. and what are things I've experienced coming from like Stanley, Kentucky, right? Two different worlds, but wow, how much curiosity, connection, and just sense of world expansion is happening in that 20 minutes. Well, and I agree with Father Larry about you know, we do move trauma to trauma sometimes, but what I've been at, I've been at Russian since the start of my sixth year, so I've seen a full class at this point. Um, and working with international students, the interaction that our students from Stanley, from small towns surrounding Owensboro and even Owensboro, the interaction they get with those international students is phenomenal mm -hmm. for their worldview. Yeah. Um, I did not go to Russia, and but in my undergrad, I didn't have a lot of that either because at Russia right now, I think we have like 27 international students. Um, and it's been higher than that since I've been there. So we have a lot. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of exposure to what I would consider even diversity in general. Uh, I'm from Owensboro. And so I didn't get that exposure. Patricia and I have talked about this until graduate school. Mm -hmm. I walked into a diversity course and was immediately intimidated and had no idea where my place was mm -hmm. in that. 
And I think our students are walking away with an experience where they do know what their place is in the diversity course or in the world because they see our international students. They talk to them about what's happening. Um, and then our international students get the same thing, you know, because we don't have just students from Owensboro. Mm -hmm. We have students from all over the country. And so they're getting the same. And it's a really... You know, our students, when they come as freshmen, I've witnessed the same thing as fall Larry. I've had students where I've had to meet with them and meet with them and meet with them <laughs> to discuss what they're doing to graduate, <laughs> right? Like, how are we getting to the end goal? And they do it. And it's a beautiful thing. And people will walk up to me and say, oh, that student's, that's not the same student that they were four years ago. You know, and it's so amazing to be, sit with them in their hurt. Mm -hmm. and whatever trauma they bring to us, but also to sit with them at graduation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to sit with them for their next step or when they, you know, they have a career later or they call you two years later and they're like, I did my dream job. You know, you helped me find this and now mm -hmm. I'm doing this other thing and it's wonderful. And so I think yes. those two things together, the trauma and the happiness is what makes these four years, five, six, um, <laughs> transformative for our students. And we see it every day. And that's the most rewarding part of what I do, in my opinion, is the combination of what that means. Yeah. The other thing is, um, it is a culture shock for international students, but it's a culture shock from, for students that are from Kentucky because a large population of our students are from those rural Kentucky high schools. Yes. And like Morgan said, then just, it's just location. Mm -hmm. So, um, so coming to Russia and meeting other students, it completely changed their perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, I know a couple of years ago we had a program where our students were going to the international center and actually helping tutor the refugees and things like oh, that. Phenomenal. So, so there, and that, and it wasn't even anything that we created. It was like they saw a need, they wanted to do it, mm -hmm. and you know, um, so they do see that. And to, to want to step out of the comfort zone and have friends that are of a dish now, nationality, a different race. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, some of them have come back to me and said their their parents weren't as receptive to that, but they don't care because they're growing and becoming their own person. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen them change total political beliefs. <laughs> I've seen them change uh, just their overall perspective. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that has to do with them thinking critically. <laughs> there you go, Anna. Yeah. Um, but them really thinking critically and, and, and diving in and learning, yeah. wanting to learn, asking those questions. Um, so we, we help create that space for those conversations. I think it is um, important those other international students bring something because generally speaking, I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think they tend to be more mature uh, mm -hmm. than uh, our domestic students at the same age. Mm -hmm. They're more worldwise. Mm -hmm. They've had more experiences, uh, more adult experiences that our culture protects our young people from. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so uh, sometimes they find that we're a little restrictive because it's like, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm an adult. You're treating me like a kid. Uh, yeah. Whereas our students, local students are like, yeah, that's kind of what I'm expecting you to do. Um, <laughs> it is. Definitely. And I think, too, a lot of their adult experiences also just come from the, the travel aspect mm -hmm. of getting from their home country to the United States. I mean, the amount of paperwork they have to keep up with, the amount of rules that they have to know, mm. and no one reminds them of these rules. They just have to know them. And then transitioning from their culture to ours in, in all facets of life, like whatever that is, um, is a lot more than some of the adult experiences in that regard that our students have experienced. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when I went to college, I had never flown on a plane by myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I'm still, I don't have a passport. You know, what's that look like? You know, I've never been out of the country and these students are doing it alone. And so I think it's something that our students are like, whoa, you know, like tell me about that because that is something that I don't, and it also makes, I like to say it makes the world real. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, when you learn about all these different places in school, you're like, oh, okay, those exist. When you meet someone from that place, it makes the world real. And so I think that's what's so awesome about it. I, I went to an international university for two years. Um, that's where I got my bachelor's degree. It was in England, um, but it was a very popular international university. So we had students from all over the world and it was life changing. And I think, especially at that young age, 
exposure to different belief systems, different value systems, and just different cultures in general, expanding that worldview makes you a more open person, a more understanding person. Um, recognizing that human nature is complex. We're all very complex beings, but our situations are honestly more similar than different in a lot of ways when we're get, getting down to feeling your feelings, mm -hmm. right? We are going through very similar experiences, even though they're very different. So I love that you guys brought that up. Um, and it's been about an hour and I like to wrap things up, but is there anything that we haven't touched on in this conversation that you'd like to add before we go into a little fun piece, but. I don't think so. I mean, that's just probably a thousands of things right. but, we can know. talk for three hours yeah. honestly <laughs> probably five <laughs> yeah no okay i did my good job of ending the conversation i apologize um so thank you for being here uh we like to wrap up our heavy conversations with just a little bit of fun rapid fire uh <laughs> exciting questions would you like to ask the first one? Sure. And I'm going to make these up as I go because in all honesty and authenticity, I left my uh, questions on my home desk. So it's just a bit <laughs> off the top of whatever my little brain comes up with. Is that good or bad? And, oh, no. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. no. I do remember this one because it's one of my favorites. What is the one gadget you cannot live without? I love the wheels. I love seeing the wheels just turn. It's a stumper. It's it a is. Stumper. It is. Gadget, gadget, because I don't even think it was my phone at this point. That is okay. That is a very popular answer. That, and, was, that was mine when I got that. And I thought of phone, but I've lived without a phone for the majority of my life. <laughs> it's only been the last 20 years that I've had a phone. So yeah. I'm, I'm still thinking. Yeah. Morgan, you got to do it. I'm going to say this. I'm gonna say my my Apple Watch. I feel weird if I don't have it on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's mostly because I have kids in daycare oh, and in yes. preschool. And if I'm in a meeting and my phone goes off, it's very, very rude to be like, let me see if you know. So I'm like, I can easily check it and if it's not important, mm -hmm. go on. But like I worry about my kids in that way. Yeah. And so if I don't have this thing on, I feel weird all I just have to say my phone because my daughter's 16 now and I have a tracker. <laughs> and I can where she's going. And I can see when she goes to school, when she leaves school. Yeah. And I'm like, where are you going? <laughs> oh, so that, that didn't exist when I was so, 16. Uh, <laughs> so. I would say I have no gadget that I can live without. Because I've lived without. I, I can imagine living without any of the gadgets oh, yeah. I have. Okay. So, well, there you go. That's, that's your answer. Fun. All right. You could have one superpower. What would it be? I want to fly. Yes. <laughs> Thought about this a lot. Yeah, so have I. That's mine. Right. I'd like to fly. I like, uh, uh, I'd be like a flash. Yeah. Oh, fast, yeah. Run really fast. Mm -hmm. Would you want to go to metaverses, though? Can you do that? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. There's That's like 23 other worlds, or is there 19? I lost track. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That's awesome. Metaverse. You are, you, you just, love, you just attained a level of, uh, Nerdiness that the rest of us can't. <laughs> My brother would be able to help you out. <laughs> I'm just saying, the pandemic opened up a whole new world. That's all I don't miss for the metaverse. No, thank you. This one is enough. <laughs> so. I think I want an orb. Like okay. orb into one space, over and out of another. Okay, I like that. I like that. Or be invisible, be in a room, be like, what are you saying? <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah. If I pull that fly on the wall thing, it was just going to be there. Yeah. I just had a major philosophical brainstorm a while back when one of the Superman movies was on TV. And I was thinking, I think this is probably a theme in Superman of what a lonely existence mm -hmm. that must be mm -hmm. to be, have godlike powers. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that is a common theme in Superman comics. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know, very much so. I'm more of a Marvel girl, but I, I will occasionally watch some DC stuff. I do love Wonder Woman. She's one of my heroes. So. Okay. What is your favorite cereal? Cheerios. Oh, Cheerios. Right off head. 
I'm going to say Captain Crunch. It tears up your gums. It but does. I love Why? it. Why? I love it. I, I regret too. it every time, but I do love it. Um, I think I have to go with the old school Frosted Flakes. That's a good I one. Okay. Favorite band or musician? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or just who you're like listening to the most right now. Favorite of all time or favorite right now? I'm going to go with favorite, favorite right now. Okay. I can't pick all time. I really like music. Um, Luke Combs right now. Okay. His new album is really hitting it for me, so. That's what's on repeat. Gotcha. When I'm playing Adele, my family leaves me alone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Adele. That's when we say, Patricia, who hurt you today? What's <laughs> <laughs> happening? <laughs> and when I'm playing 90s hip hop, I'm usually cleaning. <laughs> there you go. And when I'm playing my gospel and my adult adult conversion music, I need. Don't go in the office. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be blasted in the office sometimes. And he was like, you getting your Jesus on today? I'm like, yes, Jesus is taking the wheel today because I need him to. So it just depends on the mood. But yeah. I'm always 90s like... hip hop through and through. Love it. Yes. There you go. Throwbacks. Uh, grateful Dead. Oh, I would not pay you as a Grateful Dead fan. This is just. Wow. Yeah, my concerts are going to. <laughs> and you've been to all the concerts too. I was, I was, I, Jerry, I was at Jerry's last concert. Really? Before he died. I just found a whole new appreciation for you. We need to start this conversation all over again and get deeper in some other things. <laughs> oh my god, I love that. All right. <laughs> I love that. What is your favorite utensil? <laughs> like to eat with or to like use in the kitchen? You get to decide. Okay. Everything is up for interpretation. Spatula. Oh, that's a so good versatile. Mm-hmm. Like when I think about when I'm cooking dinner, I always always need a spatula of some kind. Mm-hmm. So we go over and then do the whip thing. I think of what it's called right now, but the whisk. Whisk. Yes, that's my thing. Mm-hmm. I whisk everything because it's so easy, and it's easier than getting out a blender or, or a mixing bowl whisk. Mm-hmm. That makes things go a lot quicker. Uh, yeah, my KitchenAid, mm. probably. I, I was gonna say a wooden spoon, but that kind of brings back memories too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you could be one animal, any animal in the world, what would it be? Penguin, panda. <laughs> uh, some kind of raptor. An owl. Oh, oh I like owls. I like owls too. It's one of my spirit. Um. Where do you go in Owensboro for your favorite beverage? What's your favorite beverage and where do you go? Uh, Lex has a good um, smoothie. It's like a, they used to have a peanut butter jelly smoothie, but I think it's just a jelly smoothie now. Really? Okay. Fascinating. I love sweet tea. I feel like the best. Is Old South. Oh, going, going away from my college. Or mm-hmm. Old South is the best. I have to say, their sweet tea is really good. I think they actually really brew it. Uh, yeah, like it is. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to beat. That's a good thing. I'm just an old school cherry lime from Sonic type of person mm-hmm. or strawberry cream slush. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. Do you have one more? No. Do you have one more? I don't think so. Well, oh no, I forgot this one. I usually ask this one. Ice cream flavor. Because on our first podcast, she asked me what my favorite ice cream flavor was, and I said chocolate peanut butter, and then I immediately was like, I don't like chocolate peanut butter ice cream. I don't know why I said that. I don't know why that came out of my mouth. So now I like to know what comes out of other people's mouth when we talk about ice cream. Mint chocolate chip. Mint chocolate chip. All right. Classic. Jerry Garcia. Oh, yes. Go with that and Jerry's. Uh, when I can eat it. Um, pistachio or coffee. Okay. Oh, maybe together. That would be a good combo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really. That'd be a good milkshake. Can I get us some ice cream? I guess that's Tom. Pistachio ice cream. Just don't give me any ice cream. It's not to kill me now. Oh, so okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. They have dairy free ice creams. It's hey, nasty. <laughs> I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. I buy the dairy fried ice creams a lot. I mean, Ben and Jerry's does a decent dairy free ice cream. I don't feel for Ben and Jerry's. I hear theirs is good. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty good. I had some, um, it was at Kroger, and I don't remember the brand, but it was really good. And it was um, coconut milk ice cream. 
it was just delicious. And I was like, mm -hmm. I don't need to eat more pints of this, <laughs> but I want to. But it was really good. It was nice coconut milk. I thought you were going to ask questions if we were going to get us in trouble, like Novo or UK, <laughs> oh. Moonlight or Old Hickory. <laughs> I have an easy answer for that one. I only follow one basketball. Brescia. Brescia. Uh, yeah, see, that makes sense. Very good. good. That makes sense. That is a perfect presidential answer. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Beautiful. Well, thank you all so much for saying yes. Thank you for coming. Thank you for talking. Mm -hmm. um, it was just very delightful. I learned a lot. Like, yeah, it's very, nice. very insightful. It was. Um, so we appreciate you all so much. Um, and we'll close out the podcast. And as I kind of always say in one fashion or another, mm -hmm. I usually tell our listeners, you can change the world tomorrow just by listening today. So thank you so much and have a beautiful day. Bye. Well, we've made it to the end of our episode. We want to thank you for listening. We hope you'll take something you heard today and use it to change the world tomorrow. We wanted to thank our music producer, Seth Hedges, from Uriah Wild Media. His website is in the show description. Also, a big shout out to Rodney Newton, our technical advisor. See you next time. This project was supported by grant number VOCA 2020 Green River 26, awarded through the Kentucky Justice and Public Safety Cabinet by the U.S. Department of Justice. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this program are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Kentucky Justice and Public Safety Cabinet or the U.S. Department of Justice. Thank you.